Greetings and welcome to... I just kicked the frickin' camera. Okay, yeah, we're, we're starting this again. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to Reckoned Opinions, bringing you pop culture top 10 lists because this, this, this is the internet. <laughs> you know, it, it's this or uh, cat memes, so... Uh, <laughs> My name is Adam, and I will be your guide today, and I never thought I'd say this, but I was born at exactly the right time. You see, I was a music fan just out of high school when the 90s started. When grunge went mainstream, I was an undergrad in college. When Woodstock 94 came around, I was just entering the adult working world, which meant I was bitter and disillusioned just in time for Woodstock 99. If that's not the story arc of the Gen X Heroes Quest, I don't know what is. So yes, the music was great, but so many things you don't know how good you have it until it's in the rearview mirror. Uh, luckily, I'm Generation X and nostalgia is what we do. So <laughs> when the iTunes Music Store first opened in 2003, I figured I'd make myself a little mix CD of uh, some of my favorite tunes from college. And when the dust settled 12 years later, that mix was 15 discs long. 300 tracks, no repeated artists. Uh, yeah, with that level of obsession, you have two choices. You check yourself in somewhere or you get a YouTube channel. Hi. So clearly when I started this video project, 90s alternative rock was going to be at the center of it somehow. But I decided I wanted to go big. I wanted to take the entire decade in one swell foop. I figured, why not take every song that hit number one on the Billboard Modern Rock charts in the 90s, from 1990 all the way up to 99, and rank them from worst to first? My god, is that a stupid idea! See, here's the problem. If, if you're trying to take the entire decade and throw it all in the same hopper and say, I'm going to rank everything against each other, you're treating 90s alternative as one big monolithic thing. And there has never been a genre that was less like a monolithic thing than 90s alternative. If you look at the British mope rock that started off the decade, it sounds nothing whatsoever like the new metal that ended it. And along the way, the road of alternative swerved all over the place. From grunge, to post-grunge, to punk, to trip-hop, to Brit-pop, to jam-band, to ska, to techno, to whatever the hell it was that Beck was up to. The thing is, alternative isn't a genre, it's a hashtag. It's, it's ten raccoons in a trench coat. It's, it's a term from the Latin meaning I don't know what the hell else to call it, so I'm gonna punt. Let's face it, when a Gregorian chant album hits the top five less than three years before a full-blown swing revival, all bets are off. The only thing that ever held Alternative together was the idea that it was away from the mainstream. And of course it became the mainstream by the end of 1991, so now what? So let's not mince words here. Uh, this isn't comparing apples to oranges, this is comparing apples to toasters, where the only thing they have in common is that they're occasionally in the same kitchen together. Um, unfortunately, I didn't figure this out until I was several hundred index cards into this project. So what do you say? Full speed ahead? Pretend like it's a good idea? Fantastic! Let's do it together. We're starting at the bottom with 145. <sighs> Mike, 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 Mike. What are we going to do with you? I don't think I'm whipping out any hot takes when I say that Mike Patton from Faith No More is a weird ass dude. He's been in 11 jillion different bands and projects, none of them sound the same, and he is the agent of chaos in every last one of them. Out of those 11 jillion, the most famous is probably Faith No More, and that's probably the most user friendly of them. And I like Faith No More. I like them a lot. Epic? That's a great song. Falling to Pieces? Also a great song. Midlife Crisis, not a great song. 
All the different elements feel like they're scotch taped together. Like the band stirred the entropy batter and then forgot to turn the oven on. The only thing tying everything together is aggression, and it's an especially hairy, unbathed sort of aggression. It's like that guy who gets on the bus and then you silently pray that he's not going to sit next to you. And we also have to point out that he anticipated new metal rap rock by several years, and yeah, points for being ahead of the curve, but of all the curves out there, why did you have to be ahead of that one? The reason this is in last place is simple. Out of all 145 songs on this list, this is the one I want to listen to again the least. Right, moving on. At what point did the 80s finally realize that they were dead? The 90s as we know them didn't start in 1990. You could say that they kicked in in the second half of 91 when grunge finally became ascendant, but there's a whole lot of bleed over from what came before. The Charlatans were central to the Manchester scene that started in the late 80s, but by 1992 that scene was already coughing up blood and you can hear it in the performance. Most of the time you are happy, you're away. The song Weirdo starts with a groovy little Wurlitzer organ part, but then the song changes its mind and decides not to give a shit after all. The main offender here is Tim Burgess, the lead singer. I don't require that my singers always sing on key if they have passion, but Tim has nothing. This is one of those rare songs that sounds like it's a bad karaoke version of itself. It's like he's watched the decline of the scene that he helped create and just given up. And if he doesn't care, why should we? Like I said, this scene started in the late 80s. And in the late 80s, I was not even remotely cool. So it's possible I was just not cool enough when this came out. It's possible that I'm not cool enough for it now. Whichever. You're done, 80s. You can stop struggling now. Really, it's okay. Just, you can sleep now. Relax. Relax. It's all good. So let's take a deep breath and go over what went wrong, shall we? Any discussion of Crash Test Dummies has to begin with Brad Roberts, the lead singer, because he's their greatest tool and also possibly their greatest albatross. Nobody else has that voice, that bass that's as deep as a well and dark and heavy as a cast iron skillet. A band with that voice at their disposal can do some amazing, affecting, beautiful things. So in the name of all that is good and holy, why do you write a song that makes him sound like a dyspeptic bull? We shouldn't have to explain this, but humming is not a chorus. It has never been a chorus. You don't name your song after humming. And if you have to make this face to make it look like you're lip syncing... No. Just no. No, 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 no. And there's not even anything else in the song to save it. We have three unrelated stories that they sleepwalk their way through. They have no connection to each other. They have no connection to you. They don't go anywhere. And then it's end of song. This is the first song on the list that I actually have nostalgic connections to, but those connections have nothing to do with the song itself and everything to do with where I was when the song came out. So it's hard for me to say bad things about this, but God, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? What is going on in Canada that that's what you're thinking? So this, this, this right here, this is why we can't have nice things. Just think about it. Now, I fully acknowledge it is unfair to blame any one subgenre for the demise of alternative music. And it's definitely unfair to blame a single band. But I'm gonna do it anyway, and if you're gonna blame a band, you kinda have to blame Limp Bizkit. Because Limp Bizkit is what happens when the dude bros take over. 90s alternatives started with grunge back in 91 and 92. And it was about young people expressing their frustration at a world going wrong and their inability to do anything about it. And somewhere along the way, that fell into the hands of guys who yelled because they like yelling. 
What started off as a sound of helpless rage became the sound of entitled rage, and that's not a good look for anybody. I mean, if you put out a single called Break Stuff, you're kind of advertising what's going on behind the curtain, and we don't want to see what's behind that particular curtain. And Rearrange isn't even Limp Bizkit's worst single. Face. <coughs> <coughs> But it's the only single of theirs that appears on this list, and I have to hold it representative of the rest of what they do. I, I know, it's unfair. I should be judging by the song itself, and I can't. I can't. The fact that I even know Fred Durst's name bothers me. The 90s are dead. Long live the 90s. In nominis patri e fili e spiritu sancti. Oh, hey, and speaking of musical genres that were ruined by white dudes who like shouting... I really don't understand how ska ever fell into the hands of the backward ball cap set. Ska started in Jamaica in the 1960s in the capable hands of Prince Buster and the Scatolites and Desmond Decker, and then got revived in 1970s London by the likes of the Specials and Madness, and then went worldwide with third wave ska in the 1980s. It was a long drawn out process to get from Jamaica to Boston, and it was a process that involved draining all the melanin out of ska whatsoever. By the time the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones got their hands on it, ska music had turned to a red solo cup set to music. It became party music for parties that I really don't want to go to. These are the guys who somehow made Madras suits look snotty and disrespectful. Look, I don't pretend to know where Ska is going to go from here. I just hope it falls into better hands. Somebody with a little more creativity and a lot less yelling. A lot less... Ah! Enunciate! We're back in the Manchester scene again. A little further from the death rattle, but I still feel like I'm being somewhat anachronistic by including it in this list. Here they're going with full-out psychedelia, only the sort of psychedelia that would have happened if hippies had ecstasy instead of LSD. That's pretty much Happy Mondays in a nutshell. When I first heard this song, I actually thought it was kind of catchy, and then I realized that there is no there there. Every guitarist at some point finds a set of two chords that they get locked into for an hour, just playing them over and over and over again. But that's something you're supposed to do in your bedroom, not in the recording studio. And there's nothing wrong with two chord songs. There's nothing wrong with one chord songs. But if you're going to do that, you've got to find a reason for it. Kinky Afro just sounds like they got their wheels stuck in the sand and are gunning the motor. And even all that would be fine if they had something to say. They have nothing. And I mean nothing to say. If the only understandable lyrics in the entire song are yippee, yippee, ya, ya, yay, yay, you, you might want to do a second draft on those lyrics. This is how the scene ends. Not with a bang, not with a whimper, but with a vaguely confused yelp. So not only was I lucky enough to be in college when the 90s started, I was lucky enough to be in a college town with a really vibrant local music scene. And there were some great alternative bands, a few of them even went national, a couple of them you might even have heard of. And then there were all the other bands. Um, they sounded something like this. I never got Juliana Hatfield, never warmed to her sound, never picked up what she was laying down. She always sounded to me like she was trying to keep her music at arm's length, both from us and from herself. She sounds like a blurry photo of Letters to Cleo. My Sister is a song that I just flat out don't understand. I, it's a song that needed to go through an editor, preferably twice. Musically, it swerves from a dissonant minor to a pop major and doesn't give any reason for doing it. I get the impression it's because they couldn't think of anything better to do, so why not? These are the 90s, anything goes, so hit record, we're going. The band skipped the beta testing stage and went straight to production like it's a Windows upgrade. And the lyrics? 
editor, preferably twice. I hate my sister, she's such a bitch. Is that really what you want to be saying here? I mean, not the sentiment, just like that. In a decade that was punctuated by some really half-assed ideas, this is probably the half-assest. I feel a little bit bad being as harsh on this one as I am. It's one of the more self-reflective songs on the list, and I'm sure she was perfectly sincere. Um, I am not sure she knew the microphone was on. Let's go to the next one. Go to the next one. Great. Here's the other thing I didn't realize when I started this. If you're using a list only of number one hits, you're going to have a really strange list. I, I mean, yes, it's a wide view of the genre, wide view of the decade, covers a lot of bases, but you're missing everybody who didn't hit number one. And there are some big names who did not hit number one. So if you're watching this and you're waiting for Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Stone Temple Pilots, Radiohead, Weezer, Dave Matthews Band, No Doubt, Blues Traveler, Nine Inch Nails, Chemical Brothers, Beastie Boys. You can stop holding your breath now because they did not hit number one, so they will not be in this video. But you know who did hit number one? I'll be a chauffeur, drive you to a distant shore. Look, I have a really good memory for pop culture ephemera, especially if that ephemera came around during my formative years. I remember a lot of music from the early 90s, and I have absolutely no recollection of this. No memory of David J, no memory of I'll Be Your Chauffeur, nothing. There's a big dark hole in the middle of my brain, and it's shaped exactly like David J. And it's not like David J was a nobody. He was the bass player for Bauhaus, so he has a vital place in music history. And I'll Be Your Chauffeur wasn't even his only hit. But somehow I waltzed through the entire early 90s when this was on college radio and I was in college and I managed to miss it entirely. It's like that chunk of raw batter that the beater completely misses in the bottom of the brownie bowl. But the problem isn't that I don't remember it. There's, there's a few on here that I don't have clear recollection of. The problem is that I listened to it and then I immediately forgot it. And then again, and again. As I sit here today, I still cannot put this in my brain. I'm kind of looking forward to the editing process so I can remember how it goes again. I'm gonna move on now because I literally have nothing else to say. So, uh, David, I'm, I'm sure you're great. So, I've been sitting here for the last five minutes staring at this camera and looking at my stack of note cards here, trying to think of what to say about this next one. And it's not that I have nothing to say, I just don't know why I should bother. Sitting here in the dubious comfort of 2021, it's hard to remember that Creed were a very big deal. And the only thing that was bigger was the backlash against Creed. And when the inevitable backlash did hit, it came early and it came hard. I mean, this thing was brutal. Creed are the only band I know of that got sued for sucking. And no, that is not a joke. They got hit with a class action lawsuit because they threw a concert that sucked so bad that they didn't think it was worth the ticket price. But in listening to this song in preparation for this video, I can't for the life of me figure out what the big deal was. There's nothing here to love, there's nothing here to hate, there's nothing here worthy of anybody's attention whatsoever. This is 1999 reduced to its lowest common denominator. Now I know the problem really was with Scott Stapp, the lead singer, because he was a problem. <laughs> 
Scott is what would happen if Michael Bolton decided he was Eddie Vedder instead of Otis Redding. He was arrogant, he was bombastic, he had a serious diva complex, and he flamed out like so many before him in spectacular style to the point that we don't talk about him anymore. His vocals are far too big for the container he's trying to cram them into. He's swinging for the fences with an insufficiently large bat. And on top of that, Hire's lyrics are more pretentious than a prog rock concept album. To a place where blind men see, to a place with golden streets. That's bad enough if he's talking about heaven, but he's actually talking about the power of lucid dreaming. I feel like he's about to invite me to a free seminar. So, alright. Full disclosure, yes, I was part of the backlash back in the day. I hated Creed, I hated Scott Stapp, I hated their music, I hated the whole thing, and I don't think it's worth the energy to hate. There's nothing there that's worth your time. It's not worth the time I'm spending on this video. Wait, why am I still talking about this? Let's just get... Uh, da, da, da. There is nothing sadder than watching an artist finally make it to the top of the mountain and then celebrate by tumbling all the way down the other side. The B-52s are one of those bands that toiled away in the underground for a decade before the rest of the world caught up with them. After losing founding member Ricky Wilson in the late 80s, the remaining band members reconvened to record the Cosmic Thing album and the mega, mega, mega hit single Love Shack. The key to their success was the holy trinity of singers at the center, the dynamic duo of Kate Pearson and Cindy Wilson, and the hype man of everyone's dreams, Fred Schneider. When the time came to record their much-anticipated follow-up, they faced two problems. The first one, and the biggest one, was that Cindy Wilson had decided to take a hiatus from the band. And with her gone, it was easy to see just how delicate the chemistry they had really was. With all three of them, the sound was chaotic and fun, but with just Kate and Fred, the sound was thin and lukewarm. It's like asking your mom to bring home Fruit Loops, but she ends up picking up store brand Fruit Circles. Yes, it's crunchy, and yes, it's colorful, but mainly you just wish she had gotten you the real thing. The other problem with Good Stuff the Album and Good Stuff the Song is that the band, once they tasted success, they decided to give the people what they want, and you should never ever decide to give the people what they want. Good Stuff comes off as a crass attempt to record Love Shack Part 2, but they ended up with something like Love Shack Part 39. Listening to this is like watching performers at Six Flags. They're smiling, sure, but you can just watch the light in their eyes slowly die. Schneider even has the nerve to throw in a Good Stuff Baby to remind you what you're supposed to be reminded of. Mostly for me, listening to this song just hurts because it's a shadow. It's a shadow of something great, it's a shadow of something wonderful, it's a shadow of something that lasted 10 years, but it's still a shadow, and uh, this is not how I want to remember them. They already came back once, here's hoping they can do it again. Come on guys, you can do it, I believe in you. And thus ends the first part of our list. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button and subscribe for more pop culture fop... Harp. Yep, we are reduced to flabby blue. Okay. Hit subscribe for more pop culture fare. I am Adam, I have been your host, and I'll see you soon with part two, just as soon as the editing gods smile down upon me. In the meantime, in the words of the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. Come on, give me a minute.